Olá, bem-vindos a todos e todas ao seminário Perspective in AI do, do, do Centro for AI. Uh, so, uh, I'm just having a, a technical issue here in my computer. One second, please. Okay. So, this is, a, a, I think it's the eighth edition of the Perspectives in AI Seminar. This is hosted by the Center for Artificial Intelligence, which is a, a joint laboratory of IBM and uh, the University of Sao Paulo. We host in this seminar some of the best people uh, in AI to talk about what's happening, what's the future, and to show the interesting stuff that they, they have been doing. If you want to ask questions to our speaker, you can use the, 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 the chat uh, in the YouTube channel. Today we have uh, a fantastic uh, presenter, Prof uh, Dr. Uh, Ron Fagan from the IBM Research Lab in Almaden. Please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Fagan. Uh, so I'd like to, to introduce, introduce Dr. Fagan. It's a great honor to have you here. Ron is one of the greats in computer science. He started as a, with a, a BA in mathematics from Dartmouth College, he got a PhD from uh, UC at Berkeley. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Science. He's a fellow of ACM, a life fellow of IEEE. He has authored and co-authored a bunch of fantastic papers. Some of them got best paper awards and test times awards. It's also a great pleasure to have someone who has won the Godot Prize, the top prize for a paper in theoretical computer science. Besides that, he's an IBM fellow. An IBM fellow is the greatest uh, technical honor that someone can get at IBM. And uh, he's going to talk today about uh, applying theory to practice and a lot of interesting stuff. Ron, please, this, uh, the stage with the field. Thank you so much for accepting to talk to us. I think all of us are really uh, w waiting to see what uh, your talk and, uh, and uh, hear what you have to say to us. Well, well thank you, Claudia, for your very, very kind words. So I'm gonna talk about applying theory to practice and practice the theory. Um, so now the purpose of this talk is to encourage collaboration between theoreticians and system builders. Uh, and I do it with three case studies. In these case studies, two of these were initiated by the system builders, and one of them was initiated by the theoreticians. Now, for theoreticians, what the more among the morals are how to apply theory to practice, and why applying theory to practice can lead to better theory. Uh, for system builders, the to, to appreciate the value of theory, why it's working with these pointy-headed theoreticians and talking to them, the value of involving them in in the process. So the first case study is Garland. It started way back in 1996. And what happened is Laura Haas, who was, uh, eventually became an Ivy Phil at the time, she was a first level manager uh, and the head of the Garland project. And she came to me and said, okay, Mr. Database Theoretician, we've got a problem with Garland, our multimedia database system. So what was Laura's problem? Well, the problem was this, is that uh, Garland was, uh, middleware is on top of various systems. It's top of DB2, our database system. It was top of Cubic, which is query by image content, where you can search for things based on their color, their shape or texture, and other stuff. And the problem was the answers to queries in these different systems were different. I'll give examples shortly. But intuitively, 
the answers to queries in, in DB2 are sets, uh, and we'll see an example shortly. Uh, and the, example is the answers to queries in cubic are sorted lists. And we'll, again, we'll see an example shortly. So the question was, how do we combine these results? How do we combine these things that are very different with the sets and sorted lists? Well, if you search, um, if you search um, a uh, database for artist equals Beatles, a CD database, you get a set, say the DB2. So here you get, here's a set of, uh, see this dates me, it shows you, you know, I appreciate the Beatles from way back when. So now this is taken from Music Brains, which has 12 million recordings in its database. So these are uh, uh, art, things by the Beatles. Now let's say you ask for album color equals red. Well, then in Cubic, you get a sorted list. So uh, I have a colleague um, who uh, initiated, um, uh, who's Richard Gabriel is an expert on uh, photographic manipulation. And he came up with an algorithm for assigning redness to these objects. And I actually showed him as the, the method, the optimal one with certain properties. But anyway, after the redness was assigned, the reddest album was at one here in the far left, 0.697 redness, next 0.683. And I think this fourth one looks reddest, reddest to me. This one is 0.659, but I guess it's just too dark. It's sort of a dark red, not just really a red. But anyway, that there they are sorted by redness. That's what cubic, cubic would give you. Now, let's say you asked a query like uh, artist equals Beatles and album color equals red. You say, oh, big deal. That's obvious what you do. Uh, you probably have a list of albums by the Beatles sorted by how red they are. So what's the big deal? Well, what about more complicated queries? What about artist equals Beatles or album color equals red? Not clear what you do then. And how about something like you have two different multimedia things, color is red and shape is round. How do you, how do you combine these? What do you do? So that's what this, the problem was. So what was my solution? Well, first of all, uh, I realized that they weren't, even though Laura told me they were sorted lists, they were scored lists. Uh, they weren't just, here's the reddest, second reddest, third reddest. Instead, here's the reddest, and here's this reddest color. Here's the second reddest, and this reddest color, and so on. So they were scored lists, and that was really important. And then I realized sets are scored lists, too. Every item has a score of zero, zero, or one. So suddenly, everybody's a scored list. So now, suddenly, we can work with them together. We've, we've merged them. They're now sort, scored lists. So now this reminded me of real value logic, sometimes called fuzzy logic. Uh, if you the word fuzzy, it sounds a little bit fuzzy, and now we usually call it real value logic. Now, in real value logic, conjunction is often taken to be the min uh, and disjunction to be the max. So, uh, so if you have an and of something with a score of point, Three and another with a 0.7, the answer would be 0.3. That's the way Zotter originally did it in his fuzzy logic. So I went to Laura and said, Laura, I got an answer for you. Uh, use real value logic. I was very pleased. I thought I was done. Laura said, well, she said, I like your solution. The trouble is we need an algorithm. We, we can't just afford to just look at the entire database, look at every single object in the database, give it a, give it a, it's, see what its scores are, and find the top case, say, if you're leading to the top 10. We can't afford that. We need an efficient algorithm. So I thought, hmm. So I scratched my head and came back a few days later and said, OK, Laura, good news. I have an algorithm. Now, if n is the number of objects in the database, like the number of albums in the uh, in music brains, uh, it finds the top k with k, say, 10, with only square root of n database accesses, rather than n, which means looking at the whole database, it's just square root of n. I thought, that's much better. But I'll never forget what Laura said. And he says, good. That's better than linear. She says, but we database people are spoiled. We're used to using uh, things like B trees, which only take log in excesses. And then she said to me, I'll never forget, be smarter, go get me a log in algorithm instead of square root of an algorithm. Hmm. So I scratched my head, came back to her a few days later and said, Laura, I can prove you can't do any better than square root of n. That's it. That's as good as you can do. You can't get log in. She said, OK, fine. And they implemented it. Now, just to show you how it does make a difference, um, using square root of n rather than n, if n is 12 million, which is the number of uh, CDs in this Music Brains database, then if you had a thousand accesses per second, n accesses, the naive algorithm that looks at absolutely everything, would take about three hours. Square root of n accesses would take about three seconds. So it really, really does make a difference. Uh, so generalizing the algorithm, well, 
uh, I realize you, you don't need to just use min, you can use any monotone scoring function. I'll define that firmly in a second, but the idea is increasing the scores of arguments cannot decrease the overall score. And because sometimes people don't want to use min, and fact, they want to use other things like average or median or something. So, so it, it, that, and my algorithm does do that. By the way, the algorithm is now called Fagan's algorithm and it's uh, been cited a lot. So the influence, well, the algorithm is implemented in garlic. It influenced other IBM products, including Watson Bundled Search System, Infosphere Federation Server, WebSphere Commerce, and others. As I said, now it's often called Figgins algorithm. And if you check Microsoft Academic, which counts citations, it's got 2,000 citations. So that's a lot of citations. A lot of people are using it or referring to it. Uh, but something happened a few years later, 2001. So I'm not and I found a new algorithm, which we call the threshold algorithm. I'll explain how it works in a second. And Here's the problem. They also with their M attributes. We'll take, like, say, redness and roundness, and we'll take M to be two just for simplicity in this talk, two attributes. And every object in a database has a score for each attribute. So every object has a redness score and a roundness score. Now, the objects are given in M sorted lists, two sorted lists if M is two, one list per attribute, like the redness list uh, sorted by redness, the roundness list sorted by roundness. And the goal is to find the top K objects according to some monotone scoring function while minimizing access to the lists. Uh, that's the point for the efficient algorithm, minimizing access. So for example, here we have uh, redness and roundness. Uh, and uh, I can now hear the background. I don't know if I'm supposed to or not. But anyway, just make sure nothing, you can all hear me. Uh well, just a uh, moment. Uh, we are having a little issue here. Is it's Maybe you should click on your slides, so because we are seeing uh, a, a little. Trouble is, my click on them that goes to the. Yeah. Next uh, do you see the, the the stop sharing button? Don't I click on that. it. I, I see the stop sharing. Uh, try to, try to click in the minus on the on the right of click, the click stop. Click on the minus. Okay. Yeah. Click on the minus. Yes. Now it's good. Because oh, this good. was blocking the page. Sorry oh, for that, interrupting. That was blocking the page for me too. I thought, how would I know? I'd love to get rid of that stupid thing that talks about sharing. Now we're back. Now I go back. Uh, I go backstage. Thank you. I'll start. I'll start over for the. No, just kidding. But great. Oh, I'm delighted to get rid. Of it. So I had to say, gosh, this is written on top of some of my words. What were my words there? I think I remember. Anyway, now it's gone. Hooray! So the minus is gone. Okay. So. Multimedia example, we have redness and roundness. So here's the redness object, object number 177, which is a redness for a 0.993. So you see here in the upper left-hand corner, it's really, really red. And, but it's, it's roundness score is not so hot. It's median, sort of 0.406. Object 235 here in the roundness list is the roundness object. It's probably, it's a circle. It's roundness is 0.999, but it's redness is not so great. It's 0.325. So, uh, so now we have our we have scoring function. So let F be the scoring function. And popular choices are the min, which is often used in real value logic, as I mentioned, uh, and average, how to combine these scores. If you have two scores, what's the overall score? And uh, so uh, let x1 through x7 be the scores of this object under the, uh, the m attributes. So in the case of our two attributes with redness and roundness, there's a redness score and there's a roundness score. Now, f of the x1 through xm, f of these redness score and roundness score is the overall score of that object. You might write f of r to be in that. So, uh, so for example, if f were the min, you take the min of the two values. If it's the average, you take the average of the two values. Now, we say scoring function is monotone if whenever the xi's are less than or equal to yi's for every i, then f of the xi is less than or equal to f of the yi's. That's certainly what you'd want out of a scoring function. If something is a little bit redder and a little bit rounder than somebody else, you want it to have a higher overall score. You certainly don't want the score to drop when the redness or the roundness increases. So modes of access. Well, it turns out, for example, you don't have all the access you want in cubic. You have two kinds of access. A sorted access, which is sequential access, where you can say, give me the next object and its score. So you've seen the reddest object. You say, now give me the next reddest object. Now give me the next reddest object, and so on, along with the scores. That's sorted access. Random access, you say, here, I just saw some object in the redness list, object 177 or whatever, what is its roundness score? So you can go to obtain the score of that object 
uh, it's around the score for the other attribute. Uh, and we want to minimize total number of accesses. That's our goal. Here, we're not going to distinguish between sort of random accesses, although we do sometimes, but here I'm not going to bother. Um, so our algorithm, we want an algorithm to find the top K object, maybe K is 10. Now the naive algorithm looks at every single object, uh, all in of them, gets every single score, calculates F of the redness score, the roundness score, and then gives the answer. Bad, way too expensive. So here's our threshold algorithm we came up with, the new threshold algorithm. So the rules are the following. You do sorted access in parallel to each of these sorted scored lists. So you look at the redness list and the roundness list, and you move, move down them each bit one by one uh, in parallel. And as you see an object under sorted access, you can do random access to go get score in the other in the other list. And if you saw its redness score, you go get its roundness score. And now you can compute its overall score. You have f of the redness score and the roundness score. That's the overall score. And if this is one of the top k answers you've seen so far, like k is fixed like 10, you remember it. You remember that's the object and the score. Uh, and now for each, we, we need a stopping rule. So here's the stopping rule. For each list i, like the redness list and the roundness list, but t sub i be the score of the last object you saw under sorted access. The last object you saw under sorted access, you need to find the threshold to be f of these thresholds. So that's not necessarily the score of any object, but still mathematically makes sense. You're taking f of some numerical values. And here's the rule. When you see k objects whose overall score is at least t, this magic threshold, stop. That's the stopping rule. So, and you return the top k answers, which you've seen so far the K answers you've saved so far. So for example, here we give sorted access and to the redness and roundness list. So we come up with object 177 with its score 0.993, object 235 with its roundness 0.999. And now you go get the roundness score of object 177, which is 0.406. And you go get the uh, redness score of object 235, which is 0.325. So now the overall score object 177, we'll, we'll send it in for simplicity here is the min of 0.993 and 0.406, which is 0.406. And the overall score for object 235 is the min of 0.325 and 0.999, which is 0.325. Uh, what's the threshold? The threshold is you apply our function, in this case the min, to the last thing you saw under started access. So it'll be the min of 0.993 and 0.999. So the threshold is 0.993. So we're pretty far from stopping. We certainly have not seen key objects whose score is at least the threshold. So we keep going. Uh, that's the next object in redness, next in roundness. Uh, and now the threshold has just dropped because now it's the min of 0.991 and 0.996. So that's 0.991. So the threshold is slowly dropping. After the next uh, iteration, uh, the uh, since the scores are going down as you move down the list, you now have the min of 0.982 and 0.992. So, so the threshold is now 0.982. So now why is this holding rule correct? So suppose the current top K objects have scores of at least T in the current threshold. We want to show it's okay to stop. You found the top K. Why is that? Well, if not, there's some object R we have not seen yet in our sorted access to any of the lists. Uh, there's some, some object S in our current top K, but the score of R is bigger than the score of S. So we screwed up, we stopped, and yet, uh, uh, there's so much we haven't even seen yet that's not in the current top K. So we made a mistake. So why can that not happen? Well, let's say there, this object R we have not seen has scores X1 through Xn. It's written as score and it's wrong as score. So now, since you haven't seen it, its value Xi is less than or equal to the threshold Ti. Because uh, uh, you haven't seen it means its score is below the last thing you saw under sorted axis. So Xi less than or equal to Ti. Well, then the f of object R, f of x1 through xn, by our monotonicity property, is f of t1 through tm, less than or equal to f of t1 through tm. Well, that's the threshold. We apply f to those threshold values, and we said that score of s value was at least the threshold. That's why it was in our current top k, and there's our contradiction. See, above we have f of R is bigger than f of s, and down here we have f of R is less than or equal to f of s. So we got a contradiction. So that really proves nothing bad. Can happen. The Holling rule was indeed correct because we got a contradiction and you soon we did You weren't correct. So now I'm going to tell you this wonderful notion of intersectionality you came up with. So here's this notion. If A is a class of algorithms like ones like the one we just saw and D is a class of legal inputs, 
for uh, for every algorithm A in this class bold A, and every database D or input D and D, we have some cost. Maybe it's the cost number of objects you 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 touch. Maybe it's uh, space, maybe it's time, maybe it's whatever, but you have some score you associate with uh, uh, algorithm A and uh, object D. Um, so now an algorithm A is instance optimal uh, over this class big A and bold A and bold D. If there are some constants C1 and C2 such that if the adversary picks his own algorithm A prime and the adversary picks his own database D, so he's been given a lot of power. He can pick his algorithm, he can pick his database, he can optimize his algorithm for his database, optimize his database for his algorithm, but yet, and yet the cost of applying the adversary's algorithm to, the, to this database D is less than or this constant C1 times the cost of the adversary's algorithm on this database plus C2. So it's really, really doing well. It's almost as good as you could get. Uh, it's within a constant factor. Um, and we call this the optimality ratio. And just to see how it's hard to be into software, let's take something like binary search, a totally different model. But if you think binary search, where the rules of binary search are you're given a, uh, a list in sorted order of numbers, and you can say, uh, uh, give me the score, let's say a million objects, give me the score of the 500,000th object. It gives you the score. And then if it's that score is bigger than the thing you're looking for, you know, you move down. And if it's otherwise, you go up. And so then you go ha halfway through. That's why it's binary search. You, if you want to go down, you take halfway down. You take object 250,000. That's what its score is. Now, the reason why, as wonderful as binary search is, it takes log n steps, but it's not instance optimal under this model because the, here's, here, so let's say in this list of a million objects, object number uh, uh, 3 million is what we we're looking for. We want to know if 3 million is there. Here's what the adversary does. He says, is object 3 million there? And then the database says yes or no. The answer, the algorithm says yes or no. And from, and if he gets a no, then he does binary search from then on. So he's wasted one uh, thing in terms of binary search, but since he attuned his algorithm to his database, and his database does have that value in the database, he wins. He got, he got it in one step. Whereas binary search takes log n steps. So this is just to show you that, that it's really, really hard to be instance optimal. There's not very many out there in the literature that are instance optimal. This is an incredibly strong property. But I'm going to show you that in a certain precise sense, our threshold algorithm is instance optimal. Now, the intuition why it's instance optimal is the following. You can't stop any sooner because the next object you see uh, might have that threshold value. So you better not have stopped sooner. So that's a good intuition. but Life is a little more delicate. So we need this notion of wild guess. So if you do random access uh, to some object you've never seen under sorted access, that's a random guess. So you, you've never seen object uh, uh, 316 uh, under, sorted access, under sorted access. We say, I'm just curious. Tell me the score of object 316 uh, in its redness score or roundness score. So that's the wild guess. And none of these algorithms, fake its algorithm, the threshold algorithm, none of them do wild guesses. Uh, in fact, the, it may even be it's not even legal by that uh, for that particular technology. Uh, a subsystem may not even allow it. So here's the theorem. For every monotone function f, like the min or the average or median or whatever, uh, let a be the class of algorithms that correctly finds the top k answers in, in our problem we're concerned with. With scoring function f for every database, it always gives your algorithm is good. It always gives the right answer, and it does not make any wild guesses. And D is a class of all possible databases, all possible uh, uh, input values. Then the threshold algorithm is instance optimal over this class A of algorithms and this class D of inputs or databases. So this is the theorem. The threshold algorithm is instance optimal. It satisfies this extremely hard property. I mean, normal, we, when people try and talk about a cost, they work at worst case. They say, what's the worst case over all my data? So I mean, this is harder. It's not worst case or average case, which sometimes people do, but every case. It's not, a, so it's got to be instance optimal, not just in the average case, not just in the worst case, but in every case. For every instance, it's got to, it's got to be optimal in this precise sense. So, uh, so that's why it's really hard to do. Now, oh, I wanted to say something. When when I um, first came up with this, and I talked to David Johnson, who's a 
unfortunately he's no longer alive, but he's the guy who wrote the book on NP completeness. He, uh, Gary and Johnson, and I told him this. He said, "You know, Ron, to call something instance optimal, it's got. To, I would say it's got to do not only what you say it does here, but it's got to have the optimal uh, optimality ratio. It's got to be the best possible optimality ratio." I said, "Oh my goodness gracious!" He's giving me homework. So I went and calculated the optimality ratio. M, remember, is the number of lists. Uh, C sub R is the cost of a random access. C sub S is the cost of a sorted access. I proved that the threshold algorithm has optimality ratio of this complicated thing I wrote down here, uh, m plus m times n minus one times c r plus c s, and I proved it was best possible. So it is. So I call it David Johnson optimal. It's not only is it optimal, it's optimal even under his very very strict rules. You got to have the best optimality ratio. So is that good? So I went to see Laura. I said, Laura, new algorithm, threshold algorithm is even better. Uh, uh, then Fagan's algorithm is optimal in a stronger sense. And Laura said, Ron, you told me your algorithm is optimal. We've implemented it. It's all over the place now. How come you're telling me about a better algorithm than your algorithm, which you said is optimal? So I said, well, Laura, there's optimal, and then there's optimal. So it was optimal in a different sense. This is optimal in this extremely strong sense. So anyway, so that was the story with Laura. Influence. Well, we submitted the paper about the fifth threshold algorithm to the top database conference, Principles of Database Systems 2001. And I was really worried. You saw the threshold algorithm. It's really pretty simple. It's about 10 lines long. I thought, my goodness, they're going to say, are you kidding me? We're the top database three conference and we're going to set a paper with an algorithm that's 10 lines long? Reject. That was my fear. So I thought, huh. So what I did is, in the abstract and in the introduction, I called it a remarkably simple algorithm. Now, this is a good rule. Make your thing, make your bugs a feature. I made it a feature. It's remarkably simple. And so, so and, and it worked. The paper was not only accepted, but won the best paper award for the conference. So my strategy worked. And the paper was very influential. Now it's got 4,000 citations. It's twice as many as fake as I made. I mean, that's a lot of citations. Um, and it won the Test of Time Award 10 years later for the conference. And uh, because of Fagan's algorithm and the threshold algorithm, I won the IEEE Technical Achievement Award in 2011 for those two things together, which is really nice. But then the real big biggie, the Girdle Prize. The Girdle Prize, uh, as Claudia mentioned, is a top prize for paper in theoretical computer science. And this paper won the Girdle Prize in 2014. It's the only database paper ever to win the Girdle Prize. Uh, and I'll just remark that they had, in 2016, they said, let's start something called Gems of Pods, where we find the best papers that ever appeared in pods, call them Gems of Pods, and this was the first paper selected for that. So, applications, I'm not going to bother reading all these to you, but why has it got 4,000 citations? It's used all over the place. You can just glance through this and see many, 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 many different applications, a threshold algorithm. I'm constantly getting bombarded with papers new app that apply threshold algorithm in different ways. Measures of success. Well, making your products better is the ultimate measure of success for practitioners. Uh, creating a new subfield, on the other hand, is a, an ultimate measure of success for theoreticians. In a certain sense, it's create a new subfield. Uh, and let me just say that the next example I give is going to be even more example of a new subfield. But if anyone tries to say, theoreticians, don't waste your time talking to practitioners. There's no fun talking to them. They, they're not as much fun as talking to theoreticians. I tell them this. Here's a paper that arose by resolving a real-life practical problem, and by golly, it won the Gurdle Prize, the top prize for paper theory to computer science. So you can't say something strong than that in terms of applying theory to practice. A paper that arose by applying a, solving a practical problem ended up winning the Gurdle Prize. Okay, second case study, Clio, 2003. Uh, so uh, Clio deals with data exchange, where we convert data from one format to another. Maybe you have what is RDF format, and you want to convert to relational. Maybe you have a relational, but you want to convert it to relational with a different set of column names. We'll have an example of that in a second. Now, Laura Haas, after Garlic, she started Clio. I thought, this is a winner. Working with Laura Haas is a winner. So I started sitting in on their meetings. So I sat in on Clio meetings for a full year, listening to all of their stuff and how they're doing it, how they're implementing it, what the issues were. And then something happened. So four of us, Fakian Koitis, Renee Miller, Wuchin Pope, and I said, look, let's forget how Clio has currently been doing things for the last year. Let's go from scratch. Let's, let's see if do, using mathematics 
uh, and our, our ideas are optimal log good algorithms, let's start from scratch and lay new foundations for data exchange. By the way, the reason Renee Miller was so young in this picture, that's her three-year-old picture. She's one of these people who does not want her picture published anywhere, but she agreed I could put her three-year-old picture there. So that's why she looks so young. She really was not a child prodigy when she did this. She was much older than that. But anyway, data exchange, you translate data from source to target. So you have some source schema, data stored in some form, target schema stored in another form. Uh, so for example, let's say we had two companies that merged uh, and one of them stores this information with employee manager and the other company has employee department, department manager. And we want to merge these two together if we somehow want to convert this employer manager thing into employee department, department manager. So how do you do that? Well, we define a relationship between the source and target, which is called a schema mapping. It's specified by things called tuple generating dependencies. Uh, so uh, this is, these TGDs or tuple generating dependencies were originally used to specify normal forms for relational database. I may use that in the fourth normal form and other things. Uh, uh, and here's an example of it. So if you have EM in the employee manager relation, so employee E as manager M, then there's some department D where employee E is in department D in the employee department relation, and department D is managed by manager M in the department manager relation. So that's how we would use what we would use to convert in this case. So what, I'm going to show you three examples of a conversion. And you're going to think to yourself, which is best. Now, if I were doing this in person, and I've given this talk in person, I have the audience raise their hand, which you think is the best. Unfortunately, I can't do that now, but you can quietly think to yourself what you think is the best answer, and you'll see whether you get what I consider the right answer. So here we have it. This is quite a good department. Gurnall reports to Hilbert, Turing reports to Hilbert, and Hilbert reports to Gauss. So here's method number one. You name the department after the manager. So Gurnall is in the Hilbert department, and, and girl and Turing in the Hilbert department, Hilbert's in the Gauss department, the Hilbert department is managed by Hilbert, the Gauss department is managed by Gauss. So that's method number one. Method number two, you say, well, instead of, you know, then we'll use these, these dummy values, these uh, make up new dummy values. And so we'll say Girdle and Turing in department D1, Hilbert's in D2, and D1 is managed by Hilbert, and D2 is managed by Gauss. But you might say, wait, just because they're both managed by Hilbert, Maybe they're in different departments. So here's Gauss in department D1, Turing in department D2, Hilbert in D3, both D1 and D2 are managed by Hilbert, D3 is managed by Gauss. So now think to yourself, which is your favorite? Number one, number two, or number three? So as I said to your live audience, I have you raise your hands. And very few people get this one right. And, and I'll tell you what the right answer is and, and why it's the right answer. So we define the notion of a universal solution. A universal solution is one as general as possible, makes as few assumptions as possible. Solution three is the winner. It's universal. It makes no assumptions. For example, it does not assume a manager can't manage two different departments. So that's the answer. It's a universal solution. Um, now, we might have some target constraints that say things like this one here says each uh, uh, manager manages at most one department. If D is managed by M and D prime is managed by M and D equals D prime. Uh, and it, that's called an equality generating dependency, in this case, a functional dependency. And now if, if, if that were indeed a target constraint, then the second solution would have been universal, uh, but we didn't assume that. So if that had been there as a constraint, that's what we would have gotten. So how do we obtain a universal solution? Well, there's this well-known process, mechanical procedure called the chase, which was originally used as a tool of database design. And we use the chase to generate the target from the source efficiently. So for example, we had this, this was our couple generated dependency. Uh, at employee E and manager M are employee manager relation, there's some new department D or some department D where E is in department D uh, and D is managed by M. So what we do is we create this new database. We say for the information that Gerdo Hilbert is in the employee manager relation, we, we uh, we, in, in the uh, employee department, department manager database, we put in ED of Girdle D, so Girdle's department D, there's a brand new D we introduce, and department D is managed by Hilbert, D is sometimes called a label null. It's a brand new value, different value for each, each time we do this. Um, and the EGDs tell us when they equate label nulls, for example, if it were really the case that a manager can manage only one department, then the label null for, for our two friends, uh, Girdle and 
Turing would have been equated. It tells you when you equate these label nulls. Otherwise, you leave them as different. So, so that's that's the story behind universal solutions. Uh, now, uh, now, whenever you have a problem, new problems arise. I remember uh, Wuchin Pumpa, one of the people I worked with, said, "Okay, Ron, we've got a new problem now dealing with this this data exchange. Composition. You convert schema S one to schema S two using these, say, TGD sigma one two." We can go from S2 to S3 using sigma 2, 3. We want to go directly from S1 to S3. How do you do it? Well, when I heard that problem, I thought, oh, for sure, there's some way to take these TGDs in sigma 1, 2 and sigma 2, 3, mix them together in some clever way and get a new set of TGDs that tells us how to do it. But to my surprise, that was not the case. Uh, you can't just do simply like that. So uh, we, uh, with Fakian Kalaitis, Switch and Puppet, and Wang Chu Tan, we studied this composition question, and we uh, we found that actually composition could take us out of first order logic. Those TGDs are fragments of first order logic. For those of you who know what first order logic is, it's so complicated going from S1 to S3. We no longer can do it. Not only not with TGDs, we can't even do it with first order logic. You had to go to second order logic. And we found the right language for this, which we called second order TGDs. Uh, I don't want to go into too much, but we gave an algorithm for composition how to uh, given sigma 1, 2 and sigma 2, 3, how you create this new sigma 1, 3 using this nice new language, second order TGDs. So measures of success. Well, uh, our stuff, our data exchange is used again throughout IBM, DB2 Control Center, rational, excuse me, Rational Data Architect and Content Manager. Uh, they use universal solutions. Originally, they were doing very yucky looking solutions. I've talked to the people and they thought, oh, this is the right way to go. We told them about universal solutions. They said, fine, we abandon it from now on. When we do, we will always use universal solutions. Uh, uh, we use, using our algorithm, they use our algorithm to produce the universal solution, the algorithm they gave using Chase, and they use our algorithm for composing schema mappings, uh, using getting these second order TGDs, which sounds awful because a second order, but so special case looking. It's not so bad. It's actually very, very workable with. Now, our initial paper on uh, data exchange won the uh, uh, Test of Time Award in the International Conference of Database Theory. Uh, uh, and um, the, it was appeared in 2003. Ten years later, it won the Test of Time Award. Uh, and, and, it, and interesting enough, I got a, a letter. We, we, the journal paper we submitted to was called Theoretical Computer Science. Uh, and that's where it appeared. I got a letter from the editor of Theory of Computer Science saying, congratulations, your paper was the second most highly cited paper of the decade. So I went, oh, great. And I just like curiosity, I sent him back a letter uh, saying, or a note, I don't remember how he had email for him. And I said, what was the most highly cited paper? I'm really curious. He said, well, it was a survey paper. We felt a little bit bad about making it the winner of most highly cited, but what can we do? It appeared in our journal. So that survey paper won. You came in second. So. That was the way it was. Um, our paper on composition uh, won the Test of Time Award for pods uh, that 10 years after it appeared. It appeared in 2004. We won the Test of Time Award in 2014. We, I, I had a follow-up paper on composition with Rainus and Nash. I won't bore you with details, but it won the Best Paper Award in 2010 for the conference. So influence. Well, this work really did create a new subfield. I mean, data exchange suddenly, uh, every major conference uh, now, every major data exchange conference now had special sessions, sometimes several on data exchange. Data exchange used to be some yucky uh, thing done by practitioners that was not very pleasant and no one cared and no one wanted papers on it. After our work, suddenly it's a whole new subfield. Many, many, many papers are very, that's why there's this huge number of citations uh, and so on. Now, for the 2003 initial paper and for our 2004 composition paper, we just recently won a prize last year, which we're very proud of, the Alonzo Church Award. The Alonzo Church Award is the highest award for logic and uh, computation. Uh, it's for an outstanding con uh, contribution uh, uh, represented by a, a paper, a small group of papers within the last 25 years. So our papers of day exchange won the Alonzo Church Award, which we're very pleased with. It was a very nice award. Uh, finally, third case study, very, very recent stuff, 2020, real value logic, something I'm working on to this very day. Uh, 
I was inspired by my manager, Alex Gray, who asked me to work on it, asked me to, to find some explanation for these things. So we'll get to that in a moment. So, so first of all, let me tell you more about classical versus real value logic. Now in classical logic, formulas take on either the value zero, which is false, or one that is true. There's nothing in between. A sentence is either true or false in a given model, in a given structure. For a given graph, the sentence is true about it or false about it. End of story. But in real value logic, formulas can take on arbitrary values, typically restricted to being the interval 0, 1. It can take on the value 0. 0.7 or 0. 0.3 or something like that. Uh, uh, sort of like what you saw with the uh, redness scores. That's the kind of thing it can do. Uh, and now, uh, this work I did on real value logic arose as part of the Logical Neural Nets project at IBM. I'm sure you guys have heard of it because it's a big deal. It's a huge project uh, in IBM right now, the Logical Neural Nets project. Uh, headed by Alex Ray, Ryan Regal is like a, the head uh, techno guy in it, and I, I'm working with him also. Uh, and uh, so the reason you might want this is you have in LNN, you have AND gates and OR gates and other things. Uh, but because of, of the way these things evolve, these neural nets move by information moving up and down the neural nets, the input to, say, an AND gate could, could not necessarily be zero and one, it could be any numbers between zero and one. It could be point, uh, the and is point 0.3 and point 0.9. That's just the way it is. Uh, that's, that's the thing that happens in LNN. So the system builders of LNN wanted to sound like a complete exponentization for real value logic. That's what Alex Ray said. Ron, this is your challenge. Go get me a sound like a complete exponentization. I'll define in a moment what that means. So I said, okay, he's my manager and it sounds cool. I'll do it. So. Now, first, let me say a little bit more about real value logics. Common choices for AND and OR are the following. The logic of worship proposed by Zada, which is often called Brutal logic, uh, the AND of x1 and x2 is the min of x1 and x2. The OR of x1 and x2 is the max. So if they the AND of a 0.3 and a 0.9, it's 0.3. The OR of those would be 0.9. Uh, that's the... Now, other logic, there's Lucas Schengen's logic, which is the main logic used in the LNN project. It's different. The end of x1 and x2 is uh, you take x1 plus x2 minus 1. Now, since that can drop below 0, we just keep it in the interval 0, 1. You take the max of that with 0. The x, the or of x1 and x2, it's, you just take it to be x1 plus x2, but since that can get bigger than 1, we're going to stay in the interval 0, 1. You take the min of 1 in that number. So that's what happens in Lucas Schengen's logic. There's something called product logic which is a lot like probabilities. The and of x1 and x2 is x1 times x2. The or of x1 and x2 is x1 plus x2 minus the product. So now negation, what's well, often taken to be just 1 minus x. So uh, that's the way Zotta originally did it. So something is score 0.3, is, if negation is score 0.7, 1 minus 0.3. So now there's anomalies in real value logic. They don't behave as nice as real value, as normal logic. There's a famous theorem, maybe the most famous in fuzzy logic, called the Bell and Wirtz theorem, which says that the unique choice for and and or that preserves valid formulas not involving negation is using min for and and max for or. I'll give you an example in a second about preserving valid formulas. So a formula is valid uh, uh, in ordinary logic. It better you want it to be valid in this real value logic as long as it does not involve negation. We'll see if things go wrong with negation. So, for example, uh, x and x takes on the value x in the Zada or Gerda logic because it's the, the uh, min of those, but it doesn't do that in Lucas Savage logic or in product logic. For example, if x is 0.6, then in Lucas Savage logic, the value of x and x is the max of 0, and 0.6 plus 0.6 minus 1, which is 0.2, is definitely not 0.6. So, x and x is not a histology. It's not always true. It's not always take on the value one in uh, in other in Lucas Schwartz logic. Uh, in product logic, it's also bad. Uh, there, the value of x and x is 0. 0.6 times 0. 0.6, which is 0. 0.36. Certainly, it's not 0. 0.6. So the fact that x and x is equivalent to x, which is true in uh, ordinary logic, is just no longer true in these other logics. It happens to be true for Zotto logic. It's still hanging in there with this, but the others it fails. But Zotto logic has its own problems. Um, with uh, although it preserves valid formulas not involving negations, it does not preserve valid formulas involving negation. So consider x or not x. Well, certainly that's a valid formula in ordinary logic, x or not x. But not here, not in Zotto logic. 
because if x takes on the value of 0.5, then not x takes on the value of 0.5, because 1 minus 0.5. xrx is the min of 0.5 and 0.5, which is 0.5. That's not 1. So zytologic also fails to preserve uh, all tautology. It fails to preserve x or not x as a tautology. It's no longer takes the value 1. So that's, that's life in the big city when you have real value logics. So now I'm talking about my stomach of the expectation. So what are our sentences? Well, let F be the set of formulas, such as sigma one or sigma two, or sigma one and sigma two are formulas. Uh, let theta be a real number in the interval zero, one. So my first thought was to say, okay, here's what my sentence is gonna be. Sigma comma theta, which says the value of this formula, sigma is theta. The value of this formula is 0.7. But unfortunately that is expressivity problems. So, uh, so, what does, for example, let's say you do sigma 1 or sigma 2 take on the value of 0.6. What does that tell us the value of sigma 1 comma theta? What are the possible, if theta is, is the max, uh, what, what does that tell us about sigma 1 comma theta? Well, it's, a, it's an infinite disjunction. In fact, an uncountable infinite disjunction, pretty unpleasant. It says sigma 1 theta, theta can be any value of less than or equal to 0.6. So that's not very pleasant. That's not nice, nice expressive. So that's, that's a, a big strike against this language. So I thought, well, I'll have a richer language. I'll have sigma comma s, where s is a subset of zero one. I thought maybe that'll solve the problem. So then that begin for disjunction. It's nice and clean now. So sigma one is an interval of zero to point six. So far, so good. But unfortunately, this goodness does not continue to hold. So I proved the following theorem. If theta is between 0, 1, and we can save its logic, for example, no finite dueling combinations of senses in the form sigma 1, comma s, or sigma 2, comma s is equivalent to sigma 1 or sigma 2 is, takes on the value of theta. So these just aren't expressive enough, unfortunately. So I needed to get richer, so I thought, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I've enlarged my class of senses even richer. So I'm going to have things like sigma 1, comma, sigma 2, comma s, which means that if S1 is the value of sigma 1 and S2 is the value of sigma 2, then the pair S1, S2 is in the set S. So that's now much richer. And, uh, but, uh, and now let F sub R of S1, S2 be the value of sigma 1 or sigma 2, the value of sigma 1 is S1, the value of sigma 2 is S2. So for example, in the Gretel logic, that would be the min of S1 and S2, and we can say this logic is that expression, the min of 1 and S1 plus S2. So now let S be the set of all S1, S2, such that F sub R of S1, S2 equals 0.6. So uh, remember, uh, so uh, then what can we infer from sigma 1 or sigma 2 takes on the value of 0.6 about the values of sigma 1 and sigma 2? Exactly what you can infer is that sigma, the pair sigma 1, sigma 2, comma S is a valid sense in my logic. It's, it's a sense in my logic, that is. It says whatever the value of sigma 1 is and whatever the value of sigma 2 is, if you uh, take the S sub R of them, you get the value of 0.6. So this is my new Richard class. In fact, I have this even more rich because you could have many things there. So I take a sentence to be something that from sigma one comma dot 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 comma sigma k comma S, where S is a subset of zero, one to the k. So what it says is that if the, the if S sub I is a value of sigma I for I between one and k, then, then S one through S k is in the set S. So that's what it says. It's just generalizing what I said before in the case of two. So a model is we have a finite set of primitive propositions. We're dealing, we're dealing with propositional logic. A model is a function that assigns a value uh, to every primitive proposition. If this proposition has a value 0.3, that primitive proposition has 0.8, and so on. Now, for every fixed real value in logic, a model of a sentence or a set of sentences is a model where that sentence or set of sentences holds. You know, and I, I told you what it means for, for a sentence to hold. So here's our optimization now. So uh, I'll give you, I don't want to give you the whole optimization, but I'll give you examples of our inference rules. From sigma one through sigma k comma s, we for sigma one through sigma k comma s prime if s is containing s prime, but that's because of s one is value of sigma one, s k is value of sigma k and so on. If s one through s k is in the set s, and certainly S1 through S case in the set of S prime if S prime is bigger than S. So that's an example of an inference rule. Here's another one. If sigma 1 through sigma k 
values in this in S1 and the values in S2, then there are the values S1 and S2, S1 intersect S2. These are all very easy to see their sound. Uh, now here's the more complicated inference rule uh, that I that really it's the key inference rule that makes everything work. From sigma one or sig sigma one dot dot sigma ks, we infer sigma one dot 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 sigma ks prime, where s prime is the set of all s one through s k's that are in the set s. And furthermore, if sigma m is sigma i or sigma j, then s sub m is f sub or of sigma i of s i s j. And similarly for and. And if sigma j is not s sigma i, then s sub j is f sub naught, which is probably one minus s sub i. So this is the key inference rule that makes us think obey our real value logic. And, you know, let, you know let's say an actualization is strongly complete if whenever gamma is a set of sentences in the logic and tau is a single sentence, uh, there happens to be a logical consequence of tau. In other words, every model of sigma of gamma is also a model of tau. Every, if, that's, if gamma is obeyed, then so is tau, uh, then there's a proof of tau from gamma. This is a classical notion in logic of a strongly complete optimization. Weakly complete would be if gamma is the empty set. So it says if, if you have something that's valid, so it take, it's uh, a consequence of the empty set, then um, that, that's what weakly complete does. Then you can prove it. You can prove the valid sentences. So now uh, an exposition is said to be sound if whenever there's a proof of tau from gamma, then gamma logically implies tau. In other words, every model that satisfies gamma must satisfy tau. And our theorem is actualization is sound and strongly complete. Uh, Alex Ray was thrilled when I gave this to him. He says, Ron, you get an A plus. He loved it. So our actualization allows us to derive exactly what information you can infer about the combinations of values of a collection of formulas, given information about the combinations of values of several other collections of formulas. That's what our actualization does. Uh, now, I'll remark that uh, for real value logics in the literature, uh, there were some sonic beat exposizations. Some were strongly complete, some were weakly complete. But uh, ours, amazingly enough, works for every single arbitrary real value logic. It's because you change with F sub or and F sub and R. And other exposizations, you know, change wildly every time you change with the logic. If you go from, from uh, Zotto logic to we could say that you drastically change the actualization, you introduce new axioms, you know, but not for us. Our actualization works for no matter what the real value of logic is. So, you know, something that arose in LNN is including weights. So in LNN, sometimes you want to weight the importance of the subformulas. You have an and, but you say this first argument is twice as important as the second argument. You get this again by upwards and downwards moving, where you decide based on, uh, uh, other stuff from later that you want to uh, downgrade the value of one of these uh, arguments. So for the form of sigma one or sigma two, we may want to assign weight w one to sigma one and w two to sigma two. So not just treat them as the same. Uh, now, look at Sanders logic. A nice way to do that is that the value of S, sigma one is s one, the value of sigma two is s two. Then the weighted average is no longer the min of one and s one plus s two, but the min of one and W1S1 plus W2S2. And so it's a nice, clean way to do weights in the Lucas-Tavich logic, which, as I said, is the main one they do in LNN. So now we, it turns out I can easily extend my sonic re to include weights. For example, instead of using F sub R of S1, S2, I would use F sub R of S1, S2, W1, W2. I take the weights into consideration. And then I get the result, our exposition that includes weights is sound and strongly complete. I think that's it. That's the end. Thank you. Oh, conclusions. Sorry, I forgot to have conclusions. Sorry about that. Conclusions, persistent builders. So consult with theoreticians, even though they're pointy headed, you never know when they're going to give you something valuable. Um, and, uh, and another conclusion for, for uh, system builders. Uh, well, first of all, I, one thing that's important is Explaining the problem is useful by itself. Just the fact you have to talk to these theoreticians and tell them what the problem is, that's useful in and of itself. Uh, furthermore, sometimes just figuring out what the problem is is a big deal. So I'm going to give you a quote from Albert Einstein, who happens to be my academic grandfather. Now, in the Q&A, somebody can ask me, Ron, how is Einstein your academic grandfather? And I'll answer that question. Keep that in mind. Somebody can ask me that question. 
So here's something Albert Einstein, my academic grandfather said, I'll read to you his quote. If I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, on getting the right answer, I'd spend the first 55 minutes figuring out proper questions to ask. For if I knew the proper questions, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. So there you go. Albert Einstein, what more can you ask? Uh, furthermore, principal approaches uh, can improve your products. You can, you can do uh, much better sometimes uh, by, uh, uh, you can, uh, for example, uh, it, this can improve your product. Uh, it can, uh, you get new algorithms that differentiates your products from other products, stuff like that. Uh, your uh, algorithmic analysis can provide information, performance expectations, uh, and proven product guarantees. Um, uh, furthermore, abstractions, for example, I showed that I didn't, I can use any old monotone scoring function, not just men uh, that I did with, for Clio. Uh, so you can use arbitrary uh, scoring functions. Um, now, for theoreticians, we have our own conclusions. First of all, even though you may say, yuck, system builders, oh, they don't understand what I'm doing. They're yucky guys. You can help your theory. Uh, you'll get new questions no one's ever asked before. Low-hanging fruit. No one's ever done it before. Uh, new models and new interesting areas of study will arise by just you talking to these system builders. You'll be the first one to work on it. You'll get new models. You'll publish in conferences. There'll be new interesting ideas. And furthermore, implementation can reveal weaknesses in the theory. Let me just give a small example. Uh, someone came up to me once at IBM, uh, kind of ignored a pass and said, Ron, we have this typical storage manager that does backup. He said, the trouble is backup takes a long time because someone makes a tiny little change in the data and we have to back up the entire data. And at the time, bandwidth was pretty expensive. And so that was a big deal. He said, Ron, we need differential backup. What we need is something that if you make a small change for the data, all you have to do is do a small change to your, your backup uh, somewhere. So hmm, we thought about that. We came up with an algorithm for uh, we, me, myself, and some other people, uh, Larry Stockmeyer, Mickey Aitai, and Randall Burns, who's a terrific programmer, and we implemented it. Now, the first reaction of the typical storage management people were, we're not going to modify our product. He says, you don't even think your thing will work. So we, uh, they took s test cases, and by gosh, to their surprise, uh, our algorithm worked perfectly the first time. Now, one thing, though, there was a slight weakness we discovered that in certain special cases where you had certain large amounts of data uh, that uh, even though it got the right answer, it just wasn't quite as good as we wanted, uh, the efficiency. So uh, we modified our algorithm. Uh, based on that, and came up with a stronger, a better algorithm. And so, by implementing it, by Randall Burns implementing it, we found weaknesses in the theory that we improved. Our, we ended up publishing the paper for that in JCM, and and that we were very pleased with it. It was highly non-trivial. And and one of the great things for TSM is after they made a big deal, they had a big publishing thing. You know, big, although they were uh, unpleasant about it at first, they didn't want to do it. They said. Great new thing, differential backup, typically storage manager. Go, come and get it, come and get it. And amazingly enough, sales of typically storage manager tripled, tripled within a very short time, like a couple of months. So differential backup was a huge winner. And once they implemented it, they, they found that. So, uh, so, uh, and furthermore, another big thing for theoreticians is, if you interact with these practitioners, your theory will be relevant. You'll be solving real world problems and you really will be relevant to the real world, including if you work for IBM, stuff relevant to IBM. And you will have a practical impact, which is a big deal, especially if you're a theoretician at IBM, it's really great to have a practical impact, not just things that appear in, in uh, technical conferences, but I have a real impact. So that's it. That, now I really have reached into my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. This was really interesting, really great. Of course, I mean, you're a special case. You had both theoretical and practical impact. It's very rare, in fact. Uh, you, and you know, even in, in, inside uh, a you. big research like that of IBM. Thank you. Uh, we, this is, as I told you, this is a series of seminars. And for everyone who came before you in this seminar, we asked, 
the first, the, the, our first question has always been the same. Wow. How do you think the pandemics affected AI and computer science research in general? I mean, wow. how do, uh, in, uh, you can talk about the impact in your work or how do you see it affecting the research in general? Well, I'll give you one impact particular from today. And that is in the old days uh, to give this talk, I would fly down to Brazil, I would I would give this talk in Brazil in person, and then the next day I fly back, and that's a big hassle for me. If someone asked me to do it, if Claudia, as nice as he has said, Ron, we'd love to have you give a talk, I'd say, gosh, I don't know, flying all the way to Brazil to give this one hour talk and to give you some questions and answers. I'm not so sure about that. And the way people would get me to do it other places like universities, they'd say, Ron, we'll pay you $3,000 and pay your fair fur to fly you out business class, if we'll just come to our university, give a talk, go back and say, well, I don't know, man, I guess so. So a big way that uh, uh, a big impact of COVID is that suddenly virtual is good, virtual is accepted, virtual is okay. So I gave this talk today virtually, it was very pleasant, I'm sitting now in my study at home, I did not have to fly all the way to Brazil. Uh, and so that to me has been a huge impact of, of COVID, a positive impact that, I, that things have become virtual. Mm -hmm. And the negative impacts, anything? That you... Negative, wow, well, negative, it's no fun, I can't see my friends, so I really miss, you know, I have a <laughs> lot of very close colleagues at, at uh, Ivy and Mama Den, and I really miss them, you know, we're just now are opening up our lab, so I've gone back for a few, they had a few little things where they were having like a, um, like an open house kind of thing, or I mean kind of a, uh, Ever get together thing and not and a few people showed up not as many as I would hope but I got to see a few old friends but still I miss a lot of them I have a lot of old friends at Alma Din that I just don't haven't talked to them for a year then for a year and a half or seen them in person for a, I'm a hugger people give me hugs I give them hugs I mean I which I say uh, there's very various people that see me in the hall they come over and give me a big hug and I feel really good about that. They can't do that during during when I'm at home and they're at their home. They can't do that. So you know, I miss very very much the personal the personal impact, the personal thing. Plus, another thing is uh, just random talking to people come up with new problems. I mean, uh, uh, in, I mentioned Laura Haas coming by my office and asked me a question. I can imagine we could have been at some kind of uh, tea time kind of event at Alma Den and you walk up to me and ask that question. So just, or someone's talking about, here's something I'm working on. Just, I say, hey, what are you working on? And they tell me, I say, hey, I haven't thought about that. Uh, how would this help? And tell them, so uh, I can do that when they're, we're randomly running into each other and randomly talking about what we're working on. It doesn't work virtually. So that's something I really, really miss. Those close personal contacts and the random interactions with people. I really miss that. So uh, we have a, a question from Dionea from USP, which, in, and when you say in the, in the special, real value logic, what's the word real related to? Ah, real is related to, it's a real number between zero and one. It's usually called fuzzy logic, but real value means it takes on some real value. So for mathematicians, mm -hmm. there's the real values, like uh, uh, all the numbers on the number line, and then there's the complex values, which involve, you know, mm -hmm. I, I also, and so real means it just takes on some real value. Some It's not real like more natural or anything. It's just real in the sense of it appears on the number line from minus infinity to plus infinity, this course. Yeah. So everything's zero or one, it appears somewhere in there, typically in the interval zero or one. So that's what we mean by real value logic. So let me do a little twist and use the word real in a different meaning, say, how hard do you think it's to express real world problems and co concepts in the in the logical neural nets that you've been working wow. on? Wow, see, I'm not enough of an expert in logical neural nets. It's a great question. And uh, uh, I, I feel like I'm sort of, I'm definitely the wrong person to ask that to, or Brian Regal will be a much better person to ask that to. So I sort of do as told, like, Ron, go get a sonic visualization. I did that. I just don't understand it. Even though I'm a co-author of this LNN paper, I still feel like I don't understand it well enough. So I feel like I'd be afraid to try and comment on that because I just don't understand it well enough to a good answer. So we have a, a question from Caio Neto. He says, how theoreticians could improve their practical skills and vice versa? And uh, and he's, he's also asking, is this relationship closer in 
I'm sorry, you faded out the last two seconds. I'm sorry, you faded out the last two seconds. Uh, Okay, let me see. So, is this relationship between theoreticians and uh, practitioners closer in industry than in academia, or, or uh, good basically, question. is how this can be made it better? I think that's that's what it's a great make... question. I think I think one reason I give this talk is to make open up people's minds to say to theoreticians, "Hey, theoretician, go talk to the practical people. Hey, practical people, go talk to the theoreticians." So that's one reason I feel like I'm uh, out here beating the bushes, uh, trying to proselytize and get people to do it. So, but I mean, the only way to do it is just to do it. The only way to do it is is talk to those people. We'll come friendly with them. I I was friendly with Laura Haas. She uh, she and I had worked together on something long long ago. So she felt comfortable knocking my door and saying, "Okay, Mr. Database Theoretician, we've got a problem." So it's getting to know each other, get, making them comfortable with talking to you. They, they don't want to feel like they're laughed at either. You know, a practitioner might be afraid if I go ask a theoretician, the theoretician will laugh at me and say, are you kidding me? That's trivial or that's, you know, uh, that's not interesting. That's not a mathematically interesting problem. Go away. So it's, I'm trying to open people's minds. I'm proselytizing, getting them to talk to each other. The only way to get it to happen is to, is to do it. And as for IBM versus universities, I think it might be easier in IBM. Uh, I may be wrong, but uh, I think theoreticians find more of a, uh, it's in their best interest to have practical impact. Um, maybe it's less so in a university. In a university, maybe all the counts are number of citations and other theoreticians saying what wonderful work they're doing. At IBM, we, we expect theoreticians to be part of the bigger community. So. We very, very much appreciate great theory work. We very, very much appreciate theory papers that appear in big conferences and good conferences. We very, very much appreciate that. We want it to happen. We want to continue doing it. We want to attract theoreticians who do that kind of thing. Uh, and we got to appreciate it or they'll never come. But by gosh, it'd be great if you could apply this stuff somehow. It'd be great if it's like some practical impact. So I think at IBM, there's more of a pressure for practical impact than there would be in a university where to get tenure, they don't care if you've influenced the practitioners. They just care about, you know, what your citations are, what other theoreticians say about you. So I think, yes, at IBM, it is easier because there's there's more of a pressure. Uh, so that would be a pressure on theoreticians. I'm not sure about pressure on practitioners. They may not feel that, but if they start to understand by example that they'll make better products, they'll have more functions, they'll be able to do things better. Like in my conclusions for them about why it's good for them, Maybe there'll be one over two, but that's one reason I give this talk. I try to yeah. sell this notion. So, so uh, you 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 told us three cases where sort of the principal approach in, did well. Do you oh, have okay. a case where it it didn't happen? Where you try oh, you had yeah. a principal oh. approach was nice oh, one. Yeah, there. in fact, you know. It's a little bit dishonest to say there are three case studies as if they're all winners. I mean, I, I should have said, spoiler alert, the three cases I give you are all ones where it worked. All the time it happens that nothing happens. I mean, it is the case someone will come out of my office, they'll say something to me, we'll talk about it, it'll be nowhere. I mean, unfortunately, that's real life. So so the, the winners are small compared to the losers, but you'll never get those winners unless you have some losers. That's just the way life is. It's like... You know, nobody bats a thousand in baseball. You, you bat three hundred or something. You're doing great, but you you strike out a lot too. That's just the way it is. That's the way it is here too. So a lot of so I have many strikeouts, uh, but you know I have some home runs in there too. So that's good. Good. Uh, the question, uh, I mean, your work is I, I think it's remarkable because it it, it, it combines complexity theory, algorithm efficiency. And it's sometimes, I mean, in the three cases you showed there is dealing with the fusing the, 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 the fuzzy side of human concepts. Okay. Yes. Right. And uh, but uh, when you look at contemporary AI and especially machine learning, you don't see much this concern about efficiency, at least in my view. What do you do you think that 
this is missing that, that people are building huge models and are thinking how to make things. Oh, oh I, I think they, I think they do. I've seen a number of AI papers where they say we're better than everybody else because we have a more efficient implementation. And sometimes I apologize and say we can't do the full the full optimal algorithm in detail because they would just take forever and take exponential time. But we can do an approximation of that algorithm that's 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 good. Uh, so, or here's a problem that's NP complete, but here's an approximate solution. So I see more and more papers like that where people do really seem to care about uh, uh, applying it. And and these papers, so we're, our paper is good because we have an algorithm you can apply that really is efficient in practice. It may not be as good as the algorithm you see in these other papers, but they would take their NP hard to get the correct answer. So forget it, we're doing as good as you can do. So I think more and more and more people are realizing the importance of efficient implementation in mm -hmm. AI and everywhere. Good. So I, I have one, one last question from an undergrad. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Oh, then I have a question for myself. But go ahead, do yours, and then I'll ask my question to so, myself. Uh, and I like it also because it's from an undergrad computer engineer student start. It sort of feels like starting is Tomas. And, and, he, and, and he says, I feel intimidated to dive deep into mathematics. So hmm. what do you recommend to him? How to, wow. how to get uh, in love with math? Look at I mean, he's wow. Good a young fellow. Or he should specialize in practice, which is wow. very alluring right now when you're on the I'm grade. afraid I may be the wrong person to ask because I've done mathematics all my life. And so to me, mathematics is like, you know, so natural. Uh, but it's like why I didn't go into physics because as much as it's appealing, I thought, I can't understand quantum mechanics. I can't go into physics. I understand mathematics. My arms around it completely. I can hold it. I can't do that. Because, by the way, many years later, I saw a quote by Richard Feynman, the Nobel laureate, saying, and I love this quote, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. I love that. I thought, it's not just me that didn't understand it. And that's why I stayed away from physics. I thought, I can't understand it. I understand mathematics. So for this person to have trouble with the math, boy, I'm afraid I may be the wrong person to ask because math is my thing. Uh, it's a good question. I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that. Or maybe but how could you get in love? But, how did you got in love with math? Oh, I fell in love with math. Actually, I remember exactly when I fell in love with math. Uh, I, uh, you know, I was always good at, you know, addition, multiplication, and memorizing tables. But when I took a, a geometry class in the ninth grade, uh, and you had the notion of a proof. I thought, wow, in, in geometry, you, you, every statement you make, you have to prove. It's not a matter of like someone, you memorize it seven times eight is 56. That's, there's no proof, you just memorize it. But in, in, in geometry, <clears throat> if you want, you have to prove the Pythagorean theorem or whatever theorem you're trying to prove. You can't just, uh, so I thought this is fabulous. I love the idea of I began, and then I thought, that's it. That's what I want to do the rest of my life. I want to do mathematics because I love the notion of a proof. And then and sure enough, that's what I did. I even went into mathematical logic, which is all the more so interesting the notion of a proof. That so, was cool because I have to say, I, I also started liking math when I learned geometry around oh, the ninth grade. It's, it's a beautiful way to introduce exactly the, the, the concept right. of proof and theory. That's true. And you said you had a one last question for you yourself. Had a question so, for myself. Last question. Since no one asked it, I will ask it. Ron, how was Albert Einstein your academic grandfather? Well, thank you for asking, Ron. I appreciate the question. And here's the, oh. answer. <clears throat> the answer is the following. So when I was an undergraduate at Dartmouth, uh, my junior and senior year, I was a research assistant to John Kemeny, who at the time was the chairman of the math department. Uh, later on, he became president of Dartmouth. At the time, he was chairman of the math department. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I remember going to his office, saw a bust of Einstein on his desk. I said, what's the story there? He said, well, when I was at Princeton, I was Einstein's research assistant. I said, really? I said, what did you do for Einstein? He said, I did Einstein's math. I said, what? Einstein needed help with his math? He said, he said I'll never forget. He said, Einstein was a great physicist, but just an okay mathematician. So, so therefore, I like to, you know, it's cheating a little normal when you talk about academic grandparents, you go via thesis advisor, I'm going via research assistant, because, hey, I'll cheat to get Einstein as my academic grandfather. <laughs> so I'm very happy to do that kind of cheating. So have you ever met him? No. No, I never, I no Einstein died in 1955, and I was, I was, okay. uh, oh, yeah, yeah. At the time. so unfortunately, 
No. Uh, I didn't. Someone asked me, did you ever interact with him? I made up a story. I said, I would sit on Grandpa Einstein's lap and he would tell me stories, but unfortunately they were in German, so I would fall asleep. <laughs> so I made up a story just for fun, pretending I'd met Grandpa Einstein, but I never really did. Yeah, that's so thank you so much, Rom. I think this was a great talk, it's a great thank conversation. You. I am we are really honored to have you as part of this series. It's a great celebration for our first year of this series. For people watching us, uh, we will have uh, some people coming soon, covering other elements of AI, other parts of AI, other points of view around AI. Yes. We will be announced soon in our, in our LinkedIn, in our Facebook channels. Yes. Ron, I'd like, again, to thank you. Thank you also for, I've seen other talks by you, and uh, it's always a pleasure. It's always. Thank you. You're very so uh, at the same time, deep in entertainment. Entertaining. Thank you so and much. Uh, I'll, I really would like at some point to be, to be able to give talks deep and entertaining like you do. Thank well, you so much. So kind of you. Thank you so much, Claudia. And thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed this. So thank you very, very much. And I enjoyed the questions also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the, to the audience. Please stay tuned to the, our next uh, um, talks. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye, audience. Thank you. Bye.